Okay, so um, in this session I'm going over interpreting graphs, which is going to be one of the most useful things no matter what you're going into because you're going to be able, you're going to see graphs in your life and you need to know how to read them properly. So why do we see, why do we need graphs? The biggest reason is because it's really hard to see patterns if you're just given a, ta a, a table of numbers. It's really hard to see what's going on. Um, and you can see the example here. I've got this data, and uh, the table is only showing a portion of the data. I couldn't fit all of it on the screen. But the graph, you can actually see what's going in with the numbers. Like you, overall on the table, you can see, oh, they're decreasing, but you don't actually see that it's sort of stabilizing, you know, kind of flattening out. And you don't see that there's like a deep, a sharp, like, decrease, and then it sort of flattens out. So you get like... You know, you can see, oh, it's increasing or decreasing, but that's about as much as you can see from a table. And the graph gives you a better way to really see what's going on. And it's also much easier to compare data when you've got it in a visual format like a graph versus um, when you've got it in a table form. So I will wait. Okay, you're back. <laughs> So how to read a graph. The key when we read graphs is we read them left to right. Um, a lot of people, I think, don't realize that. We do a lot of things left to right. And the same thing when we're looking at graphs, we're usually going from the left part of the graph to the right when we're looking at it. And this makes sense because a lot of time you're graphing things over time. And so as you move to the right, you're getting the more recent time. And so that's how time moves is basically, you know, we're moving from left to right. You do need to pay attention to your tick marks so that you know what it's counting by. Uh, this is because when you have a graph, you don't always count the same. It's not always the same scale going vertically or horizontal. So your horizontal might be counting by fives, but maybe your vertical is counting by tens. And sometimes they don't label every tick mark, they only label some of them. And so you have to figure out, well, what is it counting by? So that way you know, um, you know what the, the actual numbers are. So you have to actually really pay attention to what is labeled so you know what each division is on your graph. And then you also wanna pay attention to units. These are usually either put on the axes or the title will have the units. That way you know um, if your graph is in thousands, millions, whatever the units are in the graph. So you do need to pay attention to that. So I just have tons of examples here of all the various things you can do with graphs. Um, and we're just going to go through them all. So the first example here, I've got this graph on the right. And... Um, so the graph is, it's, it's got a title, it's the number of Botox procedures in the United States, and this is in millions. So these numbers, like when you see one, two, and three, that, those, that's one million, two million, three million. So that's really important to give you a sense of the size of the numbers. And then we, so that's what we've got on our vertical, and usually your, your title relates to the vertical. And then horizontally, we've got time, we've got years. And so we're just starting at year zero. Um, it's not giving us like a specific year. It's just, okay, we started keeping track of data. A year zero would be the first year that you're keeping track of the data. And then one would be one year later, two year later, three year later, four year later, five year later. So this is how this graph is being read. And so our first question is, for which year was the number of procedures the greatest? So the greatest is basically the largest. So you're looking for the highest dot on the graph basically so the way that these graphs are the higher the number the the more up it goes and so yeah you're looking and year three has is the highest when you're looking at the shape and so we just label that year three and then approximately how many procedures were performed in year five so often with graphs because you don't have the, the raw data you have to estimate and so if we look at year five, we look at this point, it's not quite at three. You can see it's just under three. And the next one under is 2.5. So you have to make an estimate. What I usually do is figure out, well, what's halfway between those? 
So halfway between 2.5 and 3 would be 2.75. So I know it's larger than that. And so 2.9 is a perfectly reasonable guess to that. You can say 2.8. I would probably say 2.9. But you're, you're making a guess, an estimate, based off of where it is. And it sometimes helps to divide it up, even if there's not a division there, but to kind of divide it up to help you narrow down what your number is. So we, this is, we should include the units, it's 2.9 million procedures, because it's not just there were 2.9 procedures, there was 2.9 million. And then which year corresponds to 2.3 million procedures? So that's best if you kind of go to, so halfway between 2, 2.5 is 2.25. And so you're just looking at what's close to that, and you're just kind of moving over to the right until you hit the first point that is in the right vicinity, and so that would be year one. And so uh, that's basically how we're reading this graph, is you're kind of using your grid as a, just to kind of help orient yourself so that you can figure out where these numbers are. So here's another one. This is a graph of the number of patients served by month. And so on our horizontal, it's a month. And it does have zero on the graph, but we don't have month zero. So it really goes from 1 through 12, so January, February, March. And this, so this would be for some specific year. And then we've got number of patients on our vertical. So uh, this one, we have an explanation with it, or a little explanation of the graph. It's the number of patients served by a certain ho hospice care center for the first 12 months after it opened. And so that's what the data that we're seeing here. So first one, for which, for which month was the number of patients the greatest? And so yeah, the highest number is right here. So that would be month 10. And if you wanted to, you could say October, but technically we don't actually know if this is starting in January because it does say the first 12 months after it opened. So we don't know when it opened. We don't know if it opened in December, and so then one would be January, first month after. So it's best to just, in this case, because we don't know the exact month it opened, we just know how much from whenever that, that time was to write it as, you know, month numbers in this case. And we've got how many patients did the center serve in the first month? So you just go find one on your horizontal and then you're kind of estimating. And it looks like it's on the 30. And the units here is just flat out number of patients. So we don't really have any other units. It's just literally 30 patients. Then we've got between which months did the number of patients decrease? So when you're looking at a graph and you read it left to right, increasing is going up, they're going higher as you read it from left to right. And then it goes down as you move, read it from left to right. So, and it says between which months, so we wanna give a range. So it looks like we've got a decrease here and then we're going up again. <coughs> and then we've actually got a second decrease going on right here. So we could have two answers. So what I would say is we've got um, because between months three and five, because all of those are in a line that's decreasing. And then our second decrease starts at month 10 and ends at month 12. So that'd be 10 through 12 is the second decrease in the number of patients. So it doesn't have to be like two numbers one after another, it just says between which months. So you're just looking at, okay, this whole thing is decreasing. Where is that happening? <coughs> <coughs> then we've got between which two months did the number of patients remain the same? So because four and five are close, but if you look at it, they're not exactly the same. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. This is part of the decrease. None of our decreasing months are going to be part of this answer. 
but it looks like right here it's flat. The, the dots are basically in the exact same spot. So we're going to say months eight and nine. I'm actually currently suffering a uh, sinus infection that's been going on for uh, two and a half weeks now. I went to the doctor, but still I'm waiting for the antibiotics to kick in. So if I, I'm probably going to cough more because the more I talk, the more I cough. So I apologize. I even took off medicine before this, but I guess it hasn't quite kicked in. So which month corresponds to 40 patients served? So we go from the 40 and we hit our first point right there. So that'd be month three. And then approximately how many patients were served during the 10th month? And then that would be 80 because it is very nice. The 10th month, it lines right on our grid. So you just have to read the number off of the grid. And that one's really nice. Okay, so this is getting into where people are usually struggling a little bit. So this example, we've got the price per share of a stock in dollars over a period of five days is shown in the graph. So just five days of some random stock here. And in this case, the numbers are actually labeled for us, which is nice. So interpret the meaning of the ordered pair 1, 10125 so whenever there's something that says interpret the meaning that's where people struggle because they don't know what that means interpret means you're going to write a sentence that tells us what that means and we usually write it from the the input number and then the output number so the input number is one and so one goes to our horizontal which is days so this is a period of five days. So on day one, that's what this is telling us, number one. On day one. And then the cost, or the next number is our vertical, that's our price. So the price per share is, and then our units are dollars. So it's $10, 10.125, basically. So that is what it means to interpret the order pair, is that you're taking this ordered pair and you're putting it in a sentence, and you have to make sure you're reading your axes so that you know what is your input, what is your output. So then uh, what was the change between day four and day five? So that the change, if it's just asking for change, it's just asking for the difference in the Y values. So you're just subtracting and then you need to give a direction like you would say it's dropping or <coughs> increasing. <coughs> so clearly it went down, so it decreased. Uh, then you need to subtract these numbers. So we've got 9.5 minus 8.625. So I'm just going to put that on my calculator just to verify. Um, oops, except that I forgot my subtraction symbol. And we get 0 0.875. So with the change it decreased by and we need to include our units in dollars 0.875 dollars now this would be the same as about 87.5 cents if you want to convert it to cents but because our units are in dollars we're going to keep it in dollars and then you do the same thing uh, for what is the change between day one and day five is you're basically going to find the difference. 
Now, what most people do, or the most the conventional part to do this is to take the last number minus the first number, and then that will give you a sign. So what we would really do, and I didn't do this for the previous one, but you would, is you do 8.625 minus 10.125. So you always do the final number minus the initial number, basically, when you're doing these different kind of problems. And so it gives us a negative 1.5, and that negative is just telling us that it's a decrease. So sometimes when it says what is the change, it literally wants that number negative 1.5 because it went down by 1.5, and that would be dollars per share. But we can also put it in words, it decreased by $1.50 basically per share. I should write the per share on this one as well. And so the same thing would be like the change between negative four or day four and day five it would be like a negative 0.875 because it decreased. So you would be doing your last number minus the first number. My advice is to never um, look at stock on a short-term basis because it usually goes up and down, up and down all the time. I would say look at stock over a long-term basis to determine if you want the stock. So price per share will vary like this often with the stock, but over time it may actually be increasing or decreasing. Ten years, yeah. I mean, if the stock's around that long, that definitely works. You're, you're really looking at long-term when you start investing in stocks. Some people try to make money on the short term and some people can do it, but for, I mean, not unless you have really good computers and you're like sitting there trading immediately as soon as it goes up and stuff like that. Okay, so here's one where we've got our graph and it's actually a grid because it's representing a 2D, it's, it's basically a map here. So, and unfortunately, the colors are not showing up as clear as I had hoped. So I'm going to just try to outline it here. Especially if your monitor doesn't have, you know, if the settings on the monitor are not as clear. So that's, that's what we've got here. So a townhouse has a sprinkler system in the backyard with the water source is at the origin, and then the sprinkler heads are located at points A, B, C, D, and E, and then all distances here are in feet. So we're actually using this like a map. So it's a different type of graph than what we've been looking at where it's like things are changing over time. Here we've literally got a map representing, you know, movement in one direction and movement in the other direction based off of, you know, I don't know if we could think like maybe, okay, this is north, you know, on, on a map. So that's where we're, we're looking at for the sprinkler system. So first part is estimate the coordinates of each sprinkler head. And so it's just best to go from, you know, A, B, C, D, and E. And instead of writing it in my spot here, I'm going to just write the coordinates next to the dots so that we can see it. So A falls right here on our horizontal basically and it's actually the horizontal ends right here so we need to know what that tick mark is and so this is where it's important to figure out what are we counting by the first one usually tells you what you're counting by so we're counting by 100s so that would make for a that's at 400. so it's going to be at 400 and then we go across on our y and that's at 200 so 400 feet and, and 200 feet based off of wherever our center is here. Then B, so that is at 200, because it's in between the 100 and 300, and then we have to kind of estimate where it is here. So it looks to be about halfway between negative 100 and negative 200, so you'd say negative 150. So you do have to kind of make estimates there and so if it looks about halfway, then you're going to pick halfway between those two numbers. C is, if I 
it's at negative 300 here and then negative 200 D I go down is also at negative 300 and then if I'm going across it looks to be about halfway between 200 and 300 there so we can say 250 and then E is at the origin because it's right at the origin so that's at zero and then it looks to be halfway between 400 and 500 on the y so that would be 450. so you do have to make some estimates but i find it helpful to draw arrows you know to see where they are and where they're hitting especially because sometimes it's kind of hard to see where your horizontal axis is when you've got a grid that's kind of messy like this like sometimes with the numbers it's hard to see well where is that horizontal sometimes it's helpful to oops make it darker so that you know where that grid is it's a little bit easier to find it because with all the, the lines it can sometimes get lost in there so those are the coordinates and when we're estimating the coordinates you know we, we're just looking at the numbers itself when it says coordinates we don't really necessarily need units but we do need units for the second part where it says how far is the distance from sprinkler head b to c um i think i meant to actually not write b i think i meant to do d here i think i typed the wrong letter there because b is not in line with c and so We'd have to use a formula to get the distance between B and C. We don't really want to do that. We want D and C. So we're just looking for how far apart are D and C. And so you can like count the boxes to count how much it is or do a subtraction of the Y values. And I usually do the highest minus the lowest. So D is at 250. And then C is at negative 200. So we're doing 250 minus a negative 200, which is the same as 250 plus 200. So that does indeed give us 450. Oops. And we need to include our units 450 feet. Now, whenever it's something says to ask for distance, if you ever get a negative, just ignore the negative because distance is always positive. So if you had done it the other way around, if you had done C minus D, you would have gotten a negative 450 and you would write 450 because distance is always a positive number. We don't have negative distance. Okay, so now here's an example where we've actually got two sets of data. We've, this is the percent of males and females with four more years of college. Um, and so we've got year on the horizontal and X equals zero corresponds to 1960. So that's 1960 there. So then 10 years later is 1970, 80, 90, uh, 2000, 2010. This would be 2020 here. So the data doesn't quite go to 2020, but um, they're using zero as 1960 and then this is years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, and then you can correspond that with the year now that you know what the year begins. Um, in gray is the percent of men and this kind of greenish is the percent of women and then we've got percent on the vertical as well. It's very common to see graphs where instead of writing the years, they'll put how many years after a certain point, and then you have to do the math to actually figure out what year that is. So first question, is the percentage of men with four or more years of college increasing or decreasing? So that's looking at just the gray, and you're saying, okay, overall, is it going up or is it going down as you move from left to right? So if you want, you can even like connect them to kind of visualize, but you can see that it's basically going up. It's increasing as we go from left to right. Even if it's, a, if it's just a little bit, it's still going up. And so that is increasing.
And which year was the difference in percentages between men and women with four more years of college the greatest? So here is where we're comparing the two sets of data. And the difference in percentages is going to be basically the distance between each of these points. And so you're looking for which year does it look to be the largest distance. So it does appear that right here seems to have that longest line between the two, um, which would be 20 years after 1960, so 1980. And so when we're looking at the difference in percentages, which of these has the largest, you know, gap between them? And sometimes drawing a line kind of helps you visualize that. The other way you can do it is to literally estimate the, the values. Like the men here in 1980 are at 20, and the women appear to be at maybe like 12. And so you can do 20 minus 12 to give you 8. And then you can compare it to the next one, like maybe this looks to be about 24. Uh, maybe this is 17, so that would be a dis difference of 4. Um, and then if I go to the left in 1980, that might be 14, uh, maybe 8. So that's 4. That might be 6 right there. So you can kind of add numbers to them, read the graph to figure out the numbers, and then use the numbers to figure out which one has the greatest distance or the difference between those. And then that would be 1980 still. Now the next question, uh, which for whatever reason my bullet point's not in the right spot, which seems to be changing more, the percent of, of male or percent of females, and why, or how do we know this? So when you're seeing which one changes more, you're going to be looking at which one seems to have a steeper, more of an increase. So you can look at your two endpoints versus your two beginning points here. So for the women, like the, you can see that the men and women are ending up in almost the same exact spot, but the women started lower, so that means they increased more and they increased faster. And so um, it'd be percent of females. And you can give a numerical reason for this. You could say, okay, our, our values, if I estimated for the females, um, it looks to be maybe 29. And then we're at 6. 29 minus 6 equals 23% for the females. So I'll just do that. Well, versus with the men are at 30. And they started at 10 in 1960, and that is a 20% difference there. And so you can say, well, the females, they're changing more because between those two points, it was much higher for the females than for the males. And you can explain it in words. You can even, another way to look at it is to draw, connect the points to the line and say, well, this line is steeper than the, the men. Because the steeper the line, the more change there was. And we've got, if the trend continues beyond the data on the graph, does it seem possible that in the future the percentage of women with four or more years of college will be greater than or equal to the percentage of men? And the answer would be yes, because they're already almost equal right now where they're at. And so if you you know, maybe connected a line here and followed the men, it's very possible that the women are going to exceed and be greater than the percentage of men, and very likely that it will be at least equal. But yes, go women, we are finally catching up. <laughs> it took a lot of years, but we are finally catching up. <laughs> yeah, my dog is clearly... She already had a walk. I think she's doing her barking before she eats because she likes to do that. And she's very loud, even though she's on a whole number lo level of the house and I have my door to this office closed. <laughs> so, okay, so that is a yes. Okay, 
Now here's another type of graph. This is actually a bar chart. And it's a, it's a different way of visualizing data, is you could make dots, but sometimes you can make them bars instead. Um, and then what this chart has done is basically connected the first point and the last point with a line to kind of show you a trend. So it's a different type of graph. So we've got the number of female state and federal prisoners in thousands between 1985 and 2010. Um, and so, in the year 1985, there were 30,000 female inmates in federal and state prisons. By 2010, the number increased to 120,000. Um, so X is the year, Y is the number of prisoners. <laughs> Stupid women. <laughs> I, I, I think it's just probably more about, um, I, I don't know why this could be an increase. It could be just more, more people in general being prisoners I mean we, and we don't know that this is increased only to women it could be could be prisoners are increasing in general and the men looks the same so we can't like really interpret what's going on with this crap <sighs> yeah my stupid sinuses that's what I really want to say okay so the first question here based on the graph would a line be a good fit for this data and then explain so we've got the line drawn in there. And then the question is, is this a good fit? And there's no really right or wrong answer here. I like to look at it by drawing like little dots. And for the line, like three of the dots are kind of actually below the line, but then the last two are on the line. We basically got three on the line and three off the line. So the general rule is you want to get your, your points as close to the line as possible. And um, if you've got three, you know, if you if the most of the dots are on the line, you could say, yes, this is a great fit here. Half are on, half are off, but because it still generally looks like it is increasing like a line and maybe it's not a perfect line, those other dots are really close to the line, we could say, yes, this is a good fit, especially because those last two data points are almost exactly right there. I guess technically this is slightly above, but it's, it's close. So when we're looking at real data, you're not going to get a perfect line. It just doesn't happen in real life. But you want to get as close to one as possible. And this is pretty close. It's not like you've got a point way up here or something like that. So in general, we'd say, yes, this would be a good fit. And this is because the points are very close to the line. Now, when you, if you have to go and take statistics, we actually have a formula that can determine how good your fit is. And it's called an R squared value. And the closer R squared is equal to one, the more your points make a line. So I would probably say this is probably going to be an R squared, maybe at least above um, 0.8 for, you know, based off of all the statistics I've done, this would be at least above 0.8. Um, it might even be above 0.9, which would make it a good fit. And then we want to estimate the number of prisoners in 2005. And so the line is actually kind of helpful because it kind of helps you, instead of looking at that chart, you can kind of look at the line and use the line and as an estimate. So, yeah, you can see, you can say, okay, you know, it's obviously it's going to be above 100. So you can say, okay, 105, you know, yeah, that sounds like a good estimate. And we want to include the units. This is thousands. So sometimes it's actually helpful to have that line to help you make a good estimate, especially when you have data that's presented in a form that's not actually using points, but using bars like this. Okay, so this is my last example, and this is another one where it's got a line that's fitting the data. So we've got the number of reported cases of Lyme disease in the United States can be modeled by this equation. You can see the equation on the graph. 
Um, in this equation, X is the number of years since 1993, and Y is the number of cases of Lyme disease. And so you can see there's a lot of data, and it's kind of messy, but we do have this line that we used. And this line is created by something called linear regression, which is something you learn about in statistics. Excel can do this. And so again, uh, we've got the question, do you think a line is a good fit for this data? And then why or why not, essentially? So you're saying nope, and then well. <laughs> the general rule when we have real data is, you know, if you kind of, oh, I thought I was drawing. If you kind of drew a shape around the data, is it roughly close to the line? You've got some stuff above, you got some stuff below, but they're all within like the same kind of distance from that line. If we had points that were really out of the way, and we do have a couple, like um, this point right here is kind of away from all the others and, you know, it's kind of like, well, what's going on there? But for the most part, they're all fairly close to the line. So even though it's not perfect, we would still say, yes, this is a good fit because they're all heading in the same direction and they're all clustered close to that line. Let me draw it. If we ignore that one other point, you know, the clustering is really good. They're close to that line. So we could say yes, because most of the points are near the line. And it's okay to have some that aren't. Those are usually called outliers. But we're looking at the majority of the points. And they're all relatively close to that line. And then we're going to use the line to estimate the number of cases in 2003. So we have to figure out, okay, what this is 1993. So 2003, if we just subtract 1993, that is 10 years. So we're looking at 10 right here. So sometimes you have to kind of figure out, okay, where am I looking? And then I got to figure out where is that on my graph? So this is 2003, and so we're going to use the line, so that's right here, so I'm just going to go, and it looks to be maybe a bit, halfway between 20,000 and 25,000, yeah, so halfway between there would be 22,500 cases, that would be the halfway power, uh, point, so that would be where what you would estimate. <coughs> as the number of cases in 2003. And you can even use this graph or the line that they're giving us because they have us a given equation. So let's do that as well. We have this equation and our X is going to be 10. So it's 10 years after 1993. And so I'm plugging that into the equation for X. So we've got 1,203 times 10, and then we're adding 10,000 in 6. And 20,036, which is pretty close to our visual estimate of 22,500. So that would be... That would be what the, the equation for the line then is estimating as that many cases, which are they're fairly close to each other. So this was my last example. This is basically how you um, interpret a graph, read a graph, use, you know, you, you would need to use your, your axes to kind of help you out with the divisions, understand what it's asking for. And there are certain ways that we give our answers. So like I had mentioned, um, distance is always positive. We usually subtract with the, the final answer minus the initial one or the latest one minus the, the, the newest versus the oldest number when we do our change. Um, I covered interpretate the, you know, what that means. So, um, you know, We've got increases and decreases where it looks the same, so that sort of thing. 
So are there any questions? Okay, 